Hey guys, welcome to TGS. Today we're going to be talking about badgers and the culling of badgers and badger management as a wildlife management conservation issue. We're going to start in the past. Badgers didn't used to have the protected status that they do today. In fact, it would be fair to say that the badger was being persecuted back in the late 60s. And in 1973, the Badger Act came into force. The 1973 Badger Act did protect the badger somewhat, but it wasn't all encompassing. So the Protection of Badgers Act 1992 came into force, and that is what we're running off today. That makes it illegal to disturb badgers, to disturb where a badger lives, to dig for badgers, to willfully put a dog down a badger's hole. It is completely illegal to willfully take, kill, or injure a badger, or attempt to do so, or to treat a badger cruelly. Yeah. These things have a high level of protection. There have only been four badger censuses done over the last five decades. The last one in 1980 estimated there was going to be about 250,000 badgers left in the UK. Today, we have nearly 600,000 estimated badgers in the UK. These figures kind of indicate that the government stepping in to protect the badger definitely was a good thing because it took the badger levels from here to here. However, now we have a slight problem with that we have too many. The protection has worked maybe too well. The badger is currently listed as a species of no conservation concern, a least concerned species, which means that it is not needing any conservation to keep it alive. It needs no special attention. And well, there's lots of it, which I think we can agree there is. More importantly than this double, over doubling of the population of badgers, it's worth mentioning that housing and humanity have expanded since 1980 a lot. There's nearly 28 thousand homes in the UK, residential. Back in 1980, there was about 21 million, sorry, 28 million now, 21 million 40 years ago. That's 7 million homes. Let's put this into perspective by saying that's nearly 200,000 acres of land covered by residential homes extra since 1980. That is a huge amount of urban sprawl out into the countryside, let alone little new places that have cropped across the countryside which will act as barriers. So this large population of badgers is squished into a much smaller place with less places for them to escape, less wild places and much more human, human interruption. There's lots more cars, lots more roads, lots more industrial as well. We're not counting industrial development into this either which all puts added pressure onto those who own the countryside, which is farmers. As a little aside, interestingly, in 1980, a house was three times the average wage. Now it is eight and a half times the average wage. I just want to put that out there because that is something that annoys me and my generation greatly. As a second aside that probably links to this a lot better, there is an estimate population of about 440,000 foxes in the UK. So it's estimated there is less foxes in the UK than badgers, although obviously it's very difficult to do an accurate census of either. What's also interesting to do with the fox is this. A large population is urban. Badgers haven't adapted quite so well given their lack of agility to an urban environment because a six foot wall to a badger is quite a thing, whereas we've all seen foxes can scrabble up and manage to get over many more obstacles than a badger can. Not to say that I wouldn't like to see a badger try because I can imagine they're quite a, they're quite a comical animal. They're such a beautiful comical animal. You can just imagine them trying to jump a six foot wall. It's the sort of thing you'd see in Looney Tunes. Was there even a badger in Looney Tunes? I don't know. My final aside is this, that every estimate of population of both badgers and foxes varies wildly depending on who is doing this estimate? If it is someone who is campaigning to save the badger, they reckon there's 10 badgers left. And if it's someone to campaign, if there's people who out there who think, who are trying to campaign to save the fox, who think there's as low as 200,000 foxes in the UK. I mean, I think that's definitely incorrect. But it's very interesting to see, and those who are pro-control reckon there's 8 billion. That's not actually a lie. Most people who want to control badgers use science much more effectively and use less wild estimates. So, I take that back. There's not 8 million badges out there whatsoever, but it's very difficult to say because there's very little science on it. Before I get off of foxes, it's important, and I think I should make the connection, that a fox and a badger are a similar size predator that occupies similar areas. As I said before, about 10% of the fox population lives in urban areas and a much lower percentage, like 1% of badgers live in urban areas. But a lot of science has been done into the damage that foxes do to wildlife, and not a lot is done with badgers. There's an estimated 80,000 foxes shot every year, and it's estimated also that about 12 million pounds worth of damage is done by foxes to rural 
economies, livestock, and the like. That is negated by about half because foxes prey on rabbits and other animals that eat crops. So it balances out, I think, about seven million pounds worth of damage a year from foxes, which is quite a lot of agricultural damage, let alone the damage that happens to wildlife, native wildlife as well, but we'll come to that a bit later. Anyway, let's get off of foxes. It's an interesting parallel foxes to badgers, but it's not the point in the video, so. For those of you who haven't seen a badger, it's a black and white creature that weighs about 11 kilograms, is about this long, and snuffles around on the floor. It's got black and white stripes up its head. It lives up to 14 years old, although it's more commonly about seven or eight years in the wild. You've got to think an animal living in the wild has a fairly short lifespan because they're much more susceptible to disease, damage, and roads. We've all seen badgers on roads. They're not the fastest, most agile of creatures, and like a fox that can turn on its heel and get out of the way of a car, a badger is just going to destroy your front bumper, unfortunately. Badgers breed in the spring, and they have five offspring. They live underground in these little family groups and they have a voracious omnivorous appetite. By that, they eat both plants and animals. They, well, we'll talk about what they like and what they like is generally the easy pickings. And easy pickings generally means high concern, high conservation concern animals. In fact, a badger will get pretty much anything that it can get inside its snout into its snout and eat it because, well, as much as it looks like a pig, it's actually a mustard lid. But it has that kind of rooting around in the ground, digging and eating whatever it likes. They're great, an amazing creature, as I said. However, we live in a country that has, as I've also said, a large urban population and a ever increasingly agricultural sector because we have to increase production for more food for more people. I mean, we already produce and import like 60% of what we eat and British farmers have to make more out of what they got. It's just the way of life. Because imported meat and imported produce devalue our market food, which means that farmers have to produce more in slightly more intensive settings that I think a lot of them are happy with. Because in reality, if we all actually valued food rather than just buying the cheapest possible from wherever we can get it and putting it in our bodies, perhaps we wouldn't be in this agricultural sort of system that we're in, or at least this, this pickle conservation wise and countryside wise that we're in. Anyway, that is not the point in this video either. What we're going to talk about now is the badger cull. So, in the realisation that badger numbers were rising, in 2013 and 2014, the government put together a trial cull. They did a lot of science, a lot of research to it beforehand, and eventually got approved. They had a couple of sites, and what they just determined was sites that had a high risk of bovine tuberculosis, and this was called a high-risk area, and then they put a circle around called an edge area, and they put a quota for this many badgers to be shot or trapped inside this area, and a quota for this area, the edge area and they took the science of this to see whether it indeed reduced TB. The initial trials weren't too successful in reducing TB because they didn't, in fact, and this was the conclusion, they didn't shoot enough badgers, they didn't reduce the population enough. The problem with TB is that it hangs around in water for a very long time, it can be connected snap to snout between the two animals, if they drink from the same trough it will go between them, and what doesn't do a huge amount of damage to a badger can do a huge amount of damage to a cow, and although a cow can live with it, if they get tested positive with it, they can't live with it. They are killed. So in 2015, the cull started properly. And this is all part of the government's 25 year plan to eradicate bovine TB. As a massive part of this, it's about protecting the livelihoods of dairy and beef farmers. So over the years, the culls have been determined successful, depending on what side of the argument you sit on. It is reducing bovine TB numbers and numbers of new cases in the cull trial areas, not cull, the cull areas, not trials anymore. In 2017, there were 32 cull areas and 19,000 badgers were killed. And in 2019, 40 areas have been opened up and 34,717 badgers were culled out. Did you know that it's 15 times more likely for a badger to give a cow TB than the other way around? So this year, 2020, the cull areas are increasing and expanding. And this is for good reason, because one of the areas in Gloucestershire that's been shot for the last four years has seen a 66% drop in new bovine TB cases, or all bovine TB cases. And this trend is seeming to be, be followed by other areas that have had the cut. In fact, the average drop in high risk areas that are being controlled is 11%. 11% is not a big number, but if you're a farmer, that 11% is the difference between life and death, quite literally, or bankruptcy, or profit or loss. And that, that's a big deal. So, so why now, I guess, is a thing? Well, bovine TB is much bigger now than it ever was. Back in 1980, there were only 80 outbreaks of bovine TB. And I think last year, there was like nearly 3,000 outbreaks or cases of bovine TB. So this could be viewed in a variety of ways. For example, the movement of infected cattle wasn't banned straight away or wasn't always illegal. It is now. Biosecurity is another big word that is coming into the play. 
Since that foot and mouth that 20 years ago, we've really upped our biosecurity game and a lot of farms take that very seriously. However, not all do and not all are up to scratch your biosecurity. However, you can't lay the whole thing on biosecurity's door because certain studies suggest that 90% of cases, new cases, are due to infected badgers coming into contact with cattle. Interestingly, there's a lot of uh, like preventative things that people say you can put in place. First is biosecurity, others is that you put a twin fence system in. Really, what they're asking you to do is to go from a free-ranging cattle system to an enclosed cattle system. And in fact, those who don't want us to cull badgers or, or think that badgers should be left alone think that we should just really build these walls around our cows. However, that's not going to be good for the badgers either. There's no, there's no winner there. In fact, the cows live a less lower quality of life and the badgers get less land. There's, there's a very simple answer here, and that is to reduce the badger numbers down to a sensible level nationally and also to put in place laws that mean that you have to look after your biosecurity on your farm. And it has to be a double-edged thing. You can't lay the whole thing at the door of the badger because that is unfair. And is also potentially unscientific. So methods used for the cull are high-powered rifles and cage traps by anonymous operators. Such is the heat that this whole thing has got from pro-badger people that, well, you can't do it under your own name. You have to use a special phone, secret codes, everything to stop the potential of somebody coming and harming you or getting in the way to potentially disturb what you're doing, which is going to be equally as unsafe. All cull operators are well-trained and experienced shooters. In fact, they get paid to do what they do for part of the inconvenience and part of the, I was going to say the risk. There is a, a, a risk to being a badger cull operator. So as an operator, you get about £50 per badger you cull. There's also tests in monitoring, policing and testing the badger. So it's not a cheap organisation. It's not a cheap affair at all. By comparison, you know, they reckon it costs about £700 to vaccinate a badger. The flip side of that is that it costs about £500 to kill a badger, all costs included. That includes policing and everything, which is, well, less, certainly less. However, I will come to on the end that I think there is another and slightly more intelligent way around this. Why not vaccinate is the question on everybody's lips. Vaccinate all the cows and vaccinate all the badgers. And I will come on to that, but it would be wrong not to think of the cows first. And as much as I really like badgers, I like cows. You know, they're wonderful creatures. I like milk. I like cheese. I like beef and they're just beautiful creatures aren't they there's a load that live in a field just over there and i walk to see them most days well let me tell you this 34,000 cows got killed because of bovine tb more cows got killed than badgers because of bovine tb in 2018 yeah now do you see who's the winner here because it's not the cows and the badgers seriously aren't the loser less of them died then than cows did that just seems a ridiculous way around it because a cow is worth a huge amount of money. The stress that that puts both financially and emotionally onto farmers, both dairy and beef, is just insane. So what happens is this, a cow gets blood tested. If it comes back positive, it's shot. It's not quite as simple as that, but that's a bare simpler explanation. If that cow is pregnant, it's shot. Now here's the really big issue, and that is that the test is not 100% accurate. In fact, inaccuracies can range between 20 and 50%. 20 and 50%. That's on missing positives and misdiagnosing negatives. So guess what? Your cow gets shot, then they test it. No bovine TB present. Guess what? You get a compensation from the government that isn't particularly adequate. It might cover the cost of the cow, but not really. Definitely doesn't cover the cost, the emotional cost that, that that puts on you, let alone the business setbacks that it could potentially put on you. Something's just a bit wrong in this equation, don't you think? The final thing I'll say on this subject before actually getting into the vaccination question is this, is that over half of farms that get one diagnosis will be re-diagnosed again with a positive within three years. So this isn't just like a one-time thing. No, you have the mental stress of knowing that this is going to happen again within three years and you're going to get that setback again, that emotional loss again. So, why not just inoculate all the cows? Well, this is a great idea in principle, and I'd be fully behind it. And they are in stages of developing something that will work, because currently there just isn't an option. The only thing that there is at the moment is the BCG test. However, that is actually illegal to use on cows, purely because you, it's impossible to tell the difference between a BCG not inoculated cow and a sick TB cow. So, there you go, that's it. 
They are working on a test to determine the difference, and that should be coming, hopefully, in the coming years. So potentially there is an end to this argument. The test, by the way, is called a DIVA test, and that stands for the differentiation between an infected cow and a vaccinated animal. Um, sort of. But that's what DIVA is. And that's what will be quite cool, because we'll be able to tell whether it has had a BCG test or whether it's going to die. And hopefully it should be more accurate than the current testing as well, which is the really big thing as well, because it would be awful if that had the same degree of inaccuracy as the current one does. So you also ask, why not just inoculate all the badgers and then the cows won't get it? Well, that's a great concept. However, it doesn't actually work. Vaccination doesn't cure a sick animal. So you're not testing the animal to see whether it's sick. It doesn't cure a sick animal only works I think 80% of the time in terms of knocking back the TB inside the animal as an inoculation and it's expensive let alone the cost it's, it's probably regarded as impractical and my final one here is it ignores a wider conservation issue with the large quantity of badgers that we have in the UK so here's a news flash for those of you who haven't picked this up already I like cows very much but I like wider wildlife and intelligent conservation and wildlife management better to have a huge amount of top end predators or the top of what we've got end predators running around the UK eating as much as it likes without control doesn't lead to good and positive environments. And here is my last link to the fox. That reducing fox numbers by 43% gains a three-fold increase in ground nesting upland birds. That goes for lowland as well. However, can you imagine the effect that badgers have on lowland birds? That's quite a big deal, uh, don't you think? That the large number of badgers we've got is disproportionate to the number of ground nesting birds that we've got. More importantly, flora and fauna is affected equally. Bees. So we've got like two dozen types of bumblebees in the UK. Not all of them live in the ground, but a certain amount do. And again, it's unfair to burden the downfall of the bumblebee all and solely upon the badger because, well, that would be... Well, it's just it's unfair and both insane and impractical and unscientific once again. But they do play a large part. Badgers grub out the floor. They actually dig down and eat into the bumblebee nests. You can't blame them for in its entirety. However, to say that, let's say, we have like a doubling in population of badger densities in certain areas, if not tripling, seeing as the majority of the badgers, I say the population has expanded nearly three times. Their range hasn't either. So actually, this is in a very condensed part of England. And this large boost is affecting everything. Bees being one of them. The other one being hedgehogs. And again, it's unfair to lay the burden of the hedgehog decline in population entirely at the badger's feet. However, they also have a large part to play, let alone in the decline of lots and lots of animals in the UK. I just think that there is a wiser way of managing badgers than just doing a badger cold based purely upon bovine TB. So here's my idea, and it's not particularly revolutionary. It draws concepts and ideas from other countries' wildlife management systems and puts them upon our own. So currently, DEFRA spend a huge amount of money on badger culling. As I said, about 550 pounds of badger adds up to many, many millions of pounds. Interestingly, how about we turn that on its head? DEFRA currently take a census of badgers that can be culled. Perhaps what we need to do is measure the amount of the holding capacity of badgers, a sensible holding capacity of badgers as well. I'm not saying, well, we could have a million, maybe two million. That's the holding capacity. A sensible holding capacity for badgers that still maintains healthy populations and dynamic populations across a large area. And as such, we will end up with well, less competition for food, healthier badgers, healthier cows, more wildlife. So here's my concept. What we do, quite simply, is take the money that DEFRA are currently spending and we could cut that in half. And what we could use that for instead is wildlife policing, actual accurate science paid for by DEFRA, wildlife police in the UK, I think would be a wonderful thing, not wildlife crime units sponsored by anti-shooting and anti-hunting organizations and that could be done like this so we take the coal targets that we've currently got which are done by DEFRA and we divide that out and we work out instead of saying well here's a farm and here's a high risk area let's kill that, that many badgers here and there instead what we do is we go okay so here's the areas the badgers cover we are going to reduce the populations to this. So we have a nice even spread of population to the carrying capacity of the ground, a scientifically calculated carrying capacity of the ground. I would even hesitate to say slightly below the carrying capacity of the ground because that A will make for a better population of badgers, a healthier, stronger population of badgers. There'll be more food to go around. They will eat less. As a top end predator, in large numbers, they will damage ecosystems. 
it's not difficult to concept, have that concept in your head. It's not a difficult concept to grasp that. Many predators, less prey, and that prey can be anything with a badger. Whether that is bees, hedgehogs, plants, rare plants, rare birds, ground nesting birds, grey partridge, curlew, whatever they can get their snouts around, as I've said. And I think they're amazing for it. So I'm not saying they're horrible creatures, I'm just saying that we don't need as many as we can because it's potentially damaging other animals' lives and conservation statuses for the sake of this... It's not charismatic megafauna because it's not a megafauna, but it's as good as we've got in the UK. So, what happens is we get those area limits, that area population. A census is done every year to see how many animals are on that ground. The carrying capacity for farm A is 25 badges. They have a very successful breeding season, and now we have 100 badges. So guess what we can shoot? Well, 75 badges to get that population down to a managing capacity. It's exactly the same as we do with other large animal species in the UK, deer mainly. So here's where it may get unpopular, is that actually as hunters, farmers, conservationists, gamekeepers, we pay for those tags, and that pays for that science. And the reason that this has to be governmental is the government can't argue with government facts and science. It just doesn't ever happen. So, if the government sets the quota and it's science-driven and science-led, it stays. And if we pay for that privilege to be able to remove these predators for the sake of conservation, for the sake of TB, for the sake of higher returns on your pheasants, if that's really what floats your boat, for the sake of them not digging out your flower patch, regardless of your reasoning behind the greater purpose, the greater umbrella here is for the benefit of species that are struggling. And that's the point. Could we just have an open season, a two week badger season per year in which we can go out and reduce the numbers down to a sensible level? That could work too. There is many other options other than the slightly outdated, overly expensive, overly litigious way that we do it at the moment. I'm sure someone out there will say that farmers, hunters shouldn't have to pay for having to remove badgers from their land. But what you're missing is this, if hunters are funding the science, it actually, it's a completely clean slate, there's no stick that we can be beaten with. More importantly, that I have no issue personally with putting my money into conservation. In the UK, we get off very, very lightly with not being taxed for conservation as hunters. America, Europe, all have funds by which and taxes by which you as a hunter have to put back into a government conservation pot or a wider conservation pot and i do think that it's time that that changes in some regard i'd love to know your thoughts on how this could look obviously we're going to have to submit a certain amount of carcasses in for testing is it going to be more fat than it's worth well one thing's for certain is it's going to be less fat than it is at the moment and by comparison to the rest of the world it's really not a huge amount of fat for ringing in and potentially even just taking a sample and sending that in and disposing of the carcass yourself. Like I said, we get off very lightly with the amount of paperwork that we have to do to be hunters and conservationists in the UK. So I'm not against for the right to be able to control badgers in a more sensible way, a more modern and realistic view of wildlife management, no less, to have to fill out some paperwork and make some phone calls and take a sample and do some training. It's a small price to pay for the ability to potentially save species. But that's just my thoughts. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned something about the Badger Cult and why we have to do what we do and why we currently do what we do in the background. It's an interesting subject. I am fascinated by it and I hope that this has helped put some ducks in a row for you and perhaps made you think about a slightly different way of managing wildlife than we do at the moment. Take care guys, goodbye, take care, stay safe, and uh, have another great rainy day in lockdown.